Oh, check. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining in. Uh, it will be a very interesting uh, session for us. We will talk about devices, uh, mostly on networks. And to start with, we have Philip Papes. He is a FreeBSD guy and based in Belgium. And he will be talking about ARM64. And, oh, 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 oh. that's the wrong one. Uh, give us a second. And I would really request um, our other two presenters to prepare their slides so that we don't have the confusion. There I go. So. Yes. Everything is fine. Philip, yes. it's yours. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Philip Paps. I am a FreeBSD developer. I'm also a director of the FreeBSD Foundation. Uh, does everyone in this room know FreeBSD? Good. You've all suffered my presence for. Uh, there is another FreeBSD presentation later this week, but this presentation is not actually about FreeBSD. It's about network servers. This is very interesting. Um, and by modern network servers, I mean. Well, by network servers, I mean something you run a network service on, the sort of service that sits invisibly in your network, but which everyone actually needs. So I'm not talking about your web server, which is what your, you know, your end user actually wants to see, but things like your DNS server, which your uh, end user needs to work to get to what he actually wants, or your authentication server, or your uh, accounting server, that sort of thing. The servers that sit in your network and which are managed by you, as opposed to the servers which your customers are trying to reach on the other side of the internet. Uh, so I'm going to use DNS as an example, because DNS is visible when it breaks. Uh, and I got some numbers, or actually, uh, this was made by a colleague of mine, and he got some numbers from friends of ours at the uh, .dk domain. Uh, .dk is a small country with a small amount of traffic. It's fairly representative of uh, CTLD deployments. Um, the A zone has, oh, in terms of traffic, it's about 1,000 queries per second, about a million and a bit domain names. Uh, I should look at the numbers. 11,000 of the domains in December 2016 means that there were, which is also fairly typical. But the 11,000 NSEC. Uh, Means, and I will swap microphones invisibly. Thank you. This one has better battery power. Great. Uh, the 11,000 zones are signed, or 11,000 domains in the zone are signed, which blows up the file size a little bit. But it blows up the file size to a whopping 190 megabytes, which uh, in most people's worlds is best described as a rounding error, I think. Um, and depending on the name servers, this zone expands to about a, a gigabyte in RAM, again, about a rounding error. So, uh, and the CPU load of this entire thing on an authoritative DNS server is immeasurably small. If, you know, if, this, if the name server is under attack, it'll get some loads, but under normal operation, the uh, CPU load graph is basically a flat line hovering somewhere at the bottom. Um, so 10 megabits per second continuous traffic, I don't know. Uh, how many of you run a network? Some of you. 10 megabits per second, rounding error, right? Small, too small to measure. So uh, what does this uh, TLD look like operationally? They've got the usual setup. They've got a couple of unicast servers sitting mostly in their own countries and in friendly uh, neighboring countries. They've got a couple of Anycast clouds. Uh, I don't know where these clouds are, but they've got somewhere north of 120 nodes all over the world serving this zone. Um, their uh, implementation is um, all off-the-shelf Intel servers, nothing exciting. They just, you know, we need a new server. Click, 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 and it gets shipped, and it, it comes in a nice box. They rack it, and they stick FreeBSD on it, 
uh, because what else would you put on a server? And they, uh, they, they turn it on. And across their entire infrastructure, the, uh, the resource use, you know, on, on, on average taken over a year is about 2 to 5%. So that's including things like we are under attack for a couple of days or one of our servers is under attack for a couple of days or a couple of hours, whatever. Over one year or over a sustained period of time, I think it's a year, they see that the resource utilization is between 2 and 5%. Usually it's between 0 and 0.8%, but over a long period of time, it manages to get up to 2 to 5%. What a waste of hardware. So let's talk about these uh, network servers. So why, uh, why do I want them to be different machines from your, uh, your, your actual traffic servers, the things that have things on them that people want to see? Um, the resources network servers care about are largely CPUs, they care, but they don't care very much because all of these um, things which network servers do are comparatively trivial in terms of CPU. You're not doing massive calculations. You're not transforming things. You're not fetching things from a database, doing all sorts of hideous things to them to finally present them to the user in a way they want. You're just taking something out of a file, tossing it into a buffer, and pushing it across a piece of string to the internet, and you're done. There's, no, there's nothing you need to calculate. Why do you have a CPU? Also, all the things you need to do on the CPU are trivial to parallelize. You don't, you're, you're not stuck waiting for completion on anything. You can just keep doing it in parallel. Um, most um, network servers care uh, about memory and bus bandwidth more than the amount of memory they have. So you want to get things from, mem from, your, um, from your disk into memory and out of the wire as quickly as possible. You're not going to have a lot of things sitting around in memory, and the things you have sitting around will comfortably fit in even a very modest amount of memory. Uh, network is something you care about, obviously. And finally, at the very, very, very bottom of your list of things you care about is disk I.O. Under many circumstances, your network server will hit the disk exactly once when you boot up your machine is a load operating system, and all the stuff you're serving is loaded in memory, and it will never touch the disk again, you know, under ideal circumstances. So in order, you, you care about CPUs. You want many of them, but you don't care how fast they are. Uh, you want memory. You don't need a lot of it, but you want it to be fast, and you want it to be uh, connected to your network as fast as possible. And you care about the network, because ultimately that's where your packets are going. And you really don't care about disk, or you don't care much about disk. So some attempts have been made in the past. Um, Sun, anyone remember Sun? They were a small company once upon a time. Uh, they built some CPUs. Uh, one of the CPUs they tried to build, actually they did build it, but nobody wanted it, uh, was the uh, Spark V9. It was, uh, you know, by, by Sun standards, it was low power. Uh, and it, it worked, but nobody wanted it. It failed miserably. Um, a more popular, or more successful, rather, attempt at a low-power, high-bandwidth CPU was uh, the um, Cavium made the Oction. That's very popular in embedded devices. Ubiquity uses them in the edge router. It's a MIPS, so it's pretty useful for uh, networky things. It's very low power, but it's also very, very slow. And it will have maybe uh, four cores you can fit on it, and, and you're done. So it's very slow, very small. Um, other things are things nobody has ever heard of. They were tried, they failed, they died, they went away, and, you know, good riddance. Um, Intel tried a low power processor. Uh, Intel Atom, anyone tried Intel Atom? It works well enough for five minutes at a time. Uh, and finally, there's 32-bit uh, ARM, uh, which is fairly ubiquitous in embedded devices. But again, it suffers the same problem from uh, Cavium's uh, MIPS processor. You are limited in the number of cores you can fit on a system. And also, 32-bit, seriously, uh, this is 2018. We don't, you know, 32-bits are not enough. Uh, we, we, we like our bits to be more plentiful. So, right, uh, the point of this talk, uh, ARM64, uh, is basically a new attempt at server-grade architecture. It's actually, well, ARM64 is a new attempt at a CPU architecture. It's used in every mobile phone in this room, well, except possibly your mobile phone. But uh, it's a, well, the architecture itself is called ARMv8, which is a 64-bit 
instruction set architecture. It builds on top of ARM v7, everything that went before it. Uh, but it's a little bit more, um, uh, let's say, uh, invasive than Intel's 64-bit hack on their 32-bit CPU. So ARM64 is actually an entire instruction set upgrade uh, across the entire architecture. Um, it has some nice things built into the architecture, such as uh, AES instructions, which are similar but not the same as the ones you'd find in Intel uh, CPUs. And on FreeBSD, the, the uh, AES implementation can get you about 2 gigs per second in block mode, um, which, is, which is useful. That's about your memory bandwidth. Well, but slower than your memory bandwidth, but not much. Uh, it's fast enough to get line rates easily on a, uh, on a gigabit interface. Um, you have all the usual things. So every ARM64 SOC will have all the usual things you'd find in a server, such as you know, PCI. Um, and uh, interrupts an IOMMU, all the things you'd find on an Intel board, you'll also find on an ARM board. And uh, the uh, ARM64, so in ARM32, was very much an embedded processor. You, so you build your operating system for this one SOC, and then you have another SOC, you build your operating system from scratch again. ARM64 has a much more server-targeted approach where they learned from Intel. Unfortunately, they learned some bad lessons from Intel as well. So we're stuck with ACPI and UEFI, which won't make anyone happy. Uh, but they're known, you know, they're known enemies of uh, operating system developers. And they're standardized, so you know, anyone who builds an ARM64 CPU, you can install your commodity operating system on them uh, unmodified, because all of the hardware is self-describing by uh, ACPI, and all of the hardware is mostly self-configuring by UEFI, the operating system just has to undo the damage. Um, the um, standardized nature of this, uh, this, this approach also allows you to plug in all the things you can go to a shop and buy uh, off the shelf, like you can get AHCI for SATA disks. You just go off, buy a SATA disk, plug it in, you're done. You don't have to think about it. It's all the same as Intel. Uh, same thing with uh, NVMEs or any, any PCI Express network card you find, you just plug it in, it's done. Um, so I found two boards, well, uh, about a year ago, I found two boards. The Cavium Thunder X is the high end. It's got uh, 96 cores, approximately, so that, sh that should keep anyone uh, busy for a while. Uh, it's got 16 PCI Express, uh, three-lane PCI Express cards, so it's not hugely uh, PCI Express uh, enabled, but good enough for something that's essentially idle, right? Uh, and I think it's got three 40 gig, yes. So either three 40 gig Ethernet cards or 12 10 gig Ethernet cards. So probably fast enough for your uh, DNS server. Uh, and you plug this uh, CPU, you plug it into a server board, and for about $3,000 you can get one of those CPUs, uh, a little bit of memory, and some gigabit Ethernet, a hard disk, and a 400 watt power supply. Right? That's not too bad. Unfortunately, it's very expensive. Uh, on the lower end, AMD will sell you a, an A57 uh, system, which is a little bit slower, it might have, you know, 20 cores or 16 cores or a, mo a modest number of cores. And for about $600, you can get a four-core device with some memory, eight gigs of memory. Remember, the DK zone is one gigabyte in memory, so it can fit in here eight times or it can grow eight times before it stops being resident. Um, you have some USB ports, you know, usually slightly broken. Why would you want it in a server? I don't know, but people have them. And you can stick a hard disk in there as well. Um, so let's talk about operating systems. Uh, ARM64 on FreeBSD is a tier one platform, so you can just uh, download FreeBSD, fully support it, install it on your system. Uh, it's fully supported by binary upgrades, so every time something breaks, you just type FreeBSD update fetch, and FreeBSD update install, and your operating system is up to date and secure. Uh, every time bind breaks or unbound breaks or, well, unbound, bind breaks or NSD or not breaks, you package upgrade and you have all the security patches and life is good. And, you know, even if you're not using it for DNS, you have 20,000 other software packages which you can just run on this system. Um, DNS is fully supported on FreeBSD, of course. The uh, NSD people and, IS, uh, and ISC uh, support bind and... Um, bind an NSD directly on FreeBSD and power DNS and not also just work out of the ports and are well maintained. 
Um, right. So performance comparison, because you know this talk would be all marketing and no numbers unless I threw some numbers at you. Um, so I took an Intel Xeon, because it was the one I could find in the FreeBSD cluster. I asked someone what it costs. Uh, this was a uh, $3,000 machine, approximately. It's a, uh, is that a, that's a Broadwell, I think. Yes, it's a Broadwell, 10 cores, a modest amount of memory, uh, some disks and stuff. And I found another machine in FreeBSD, 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 pronounce it right, Philip, uh, cluster, which uh, cost about the same. It's Gavion boards, so the very high-powered one. And I just had them run a very pessimal workload, go and compile the LLVM compiler. The LLVM compiler has um, thousands of files, and there's a really terrible workload to throw at the server. Uh, the uh, ThunderX board took about half an hour of wall clock time and about 20 hours of CPU time. So really, really, really slow. Uh, the Xeon uh, blew it right out of, the out of the water in about 10 minutes and an hour of CPU time. Uh, the Xeon was done compiling this thing. But uh, DNS servers spent very little time compiling compilers. It's not what DNS servers do. Uh, the LLVM builds workloads is stupidly pessimal. It's uh, lots of continuous disk I.O. You're fetching all these thousands of source files, generating new source files, and just throwing them at the CPUs and seeing what, it, what, what they do. It's also very, very difficult to parallelize, because things like the linker will just sit on this core and just sit there and sit there and sit there. And then finally, something comes out. On the other hand, you've got an authoritative DNS server running things like NSD. You have, well, you hit the disk once to load your zone file. All of it fits in memory. And you never see the disk again. And then, um, yeah, uh, your entire working set is in memory. So I think, I don't know all the CCTLDs, but I think .de is a very large one and still would fit in memory. I don't think COM would fit in memory, but you know, just have more memory. Um, and it's very easy to parallelize. You load your, your, your record, your requests, you stick it in a buffer, and you throw it out on the network, and you're done. Right? So perfect for lots of small cores. Um, and that's actually, so that's one thing, uh, but then the real point of these ARM64, so they're cheaper, you can run this on a A57, but also uh, you spend a stupid amount of money cooling the servers you have in your network. Uh, so your uh, Intel server will uh, run very hot, so the, uh, the Haswell on paper dissipates 135 watts um, on paper, and under load it's 250 watts, it's just heating up the room, uh, and the, uh, the cooling to cool this thing down will also cool, uh, heat up the room. So your entire data center is basically running very warm. On the ARM64, on the other hand, the Thunder X, which is, remember, the very large board, is 120 watts on paper, and under load, under full load compiling LLVM, the little power meter says 200 watts, which is, you know, uh, substantially less than the other one. And again, this is not a realistic workload for this sort of machine. It is going to run a lot less uh, warm on a network workload. Um, so, and the, uh, the AMD one, for instance, is, I didn't find a number, but I suspect it's around 80 watts. 80 watts uh, idle and maybe 100 and, 180, uh, 180, 100 loads. Um, so, yeah, so I come from a very cold part of the world. Cooling your data center is a matter of opening the window in the winter and two windows in summer. Uh, in this part of the world, cooling your data center is not a matter of opening windows, it's a matter of spending actual money. Uh, so the ARM64 is probably a better way to spend less money, cheaper hardware, cheaper cooling, and all sorts of goodness, than these Intel servers. And I think that puts me at the end of my allotted time with two minutes left for questions. Any questions? Questions? So, who runs a DNS server? What, what are you running on it? Right, but what operating system? Why? <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, it's all my fault. Uh, no, uh, but if you are running a DNS server and you're running it on commodity Intel hardware, then it is costing you money. Uh, it, it, it's just, it's sitting there, it's sitting in your rack and it's costing you money. 
you're, you're cooling it and it's doing nothing. So it's, it's just heating up the room. And you, you, know, you expect to spend about $3,000 on a server. The next time you buy a server, spend those $3,000 on an ARM server rather than spending them on an Intel server. Of course, uh, there is Beehive, uh, which is, uh, I think, it's a bit, well, you should come to my talk on Wednesday afternoon, which uh, tells you all of these things. Uh, but yes, there is Beehive, it runs, it has been ported to ARM64, I think, in FreeBSD 11, or possibly ba way back in 10. Uh, so that's been done. You can run, yeah, you can run Beehive, no problem. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. We also have jails, so you might not even need a hyper, you might not even need a hypervisor. Uh, okay, just the uh, yeah. container style. You can just jail. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, better to not ask FreeBSD type question, otherwise well, Philip will take hold the I'm, session. I'm here, uh, he, I, I'm, I'm, here, I'm here all week. Yeah. <laughs> all week. <laughs> oh dear, now I'm, being, now I'm in trouble. Um, hi there, uh, my name is Nishal. I work at Packet Clearinghouse, but this isn't a PCH question. Uh, related, but slightly unusual question. Um, there was a lot is earlier in this year about a particular uh, a vendor that had problems with uh, the chipsets that they were making at the time. We all know who they were. And move on, move on. Um, and ARM64 was touted as a viable replacement. And there was a lot of noise on a lot of uh, software mailing lists um, that some, of pe some people here hang out on about um, how this should be uh, a way to look forward. Firstly, was that a motivation for why you're doing this talk? Okay. Uh, secondly, um, since you hang out on these mailing lists more than us mere mortals, can you tell us about some of the other developments that perhaps are happening that are more geared towards making this more viable as an alternative just for us mere mortals? Right. Thanks. Yes. So your first question, uh, I've already forgotten. Oh, no, I haven't forgotten. Is did I write this talk because of that? Uh, no, I didn't. This talk uh, predates that. I think, uh, I think I wrote this talk a week before I heard about the, uh, the fun and games uh, that, that you refer to, which is about three days before everyone else heard about them. Uh, great, that went well. Uh, yeah, so ARM64 uh, also suffers from uh, some of the vulnerabilities. So the vulnerabilities for anyone who was living under a rock uh, earlier this year is that every CPU since the mid-90s has been uh, executing out of order and has been doing speculative execution. So what you do is you have a bunch of instructions and your CPU goes and happily, you know, jumps on the instructions and does something meaningful with them. And you run, you know, you can run them in a straight line and, that, and, and you'll get some performance out. But it's a lot more uh, efficient if the CPU can guess what the next instruction is going to be based on the instructions it's already seen. So what uh, smart CPUs have been doing since the 90s is they've been uh, prefetching all, all kinds of instructions uh, and loading, preloading them into the pipeline, trying to execute them and seeing what happens, and then you know, throwing away the results of the paths, the branches that have not been followed. Unfortunately, uh, the people who came up with this uh, wonderful scheme, which is actually fast and, and really useful and really viable, had forgotten that several instructions have side effects. So you speculatively execute some branch, and the result of that ends up in the cache, and then you can find the result of the cache, or you can find the existence of the result in the cache, and you can do all sorts of nasty, nasty, nasty things with that, which uh, are, are just very, very bad. Uh, and the Intel architecture in particular is vulnerable to several classes of problems problems like this. Uh, ARM64 is also vulnerable to some of these bugs, but not all of them. So for your DNS server, you care about none of these bugs because you tend to run exactly one process on your DNS server, and it is going to be NSD or not or bind. Uh, you're not going to run your customer, customer A's web server next to customer B's web server on your DNS server. Um, so ARM64, yes, it is less vulnerable to these problems, but it doesn't matter for this workload. Does that answer your question, Michel? No. Okay. <laughs> Told you I was in trouble. <laughs> no, I don't think it was a matter of you being in trouble. I don't think you understood my question. Okay. So I'll say it slowly this time. Okay. 
Um, uh, my, my question was more about uh, the development for these things. Now, one, one complaint you're going to hear from a lot of people here is that they're not, they're not going to be able to use ARM64 even for other type services. Perhaps let's pick something that's a little DHCP because the, uh, the package that they want hasn't been ported to, oh, what's it called these days, uh, I386 or whatever it is, right? Um, because of the, my, my question was really around the, vulnerab the vulnerabilities and the problems they exposed with us relying too much on a common code base, mm -hmm. okay? From your perspective, where you sit in the development world, has there been an upsurge in, from a development folk saying, well, you know what, we're not giving this enough love. We now need to start spending more time on ARM64. Oh, yes, absolutely. There's a lot of very active development on uh, ARM64, on, uh, and especially in the FreeBSD community, there, a lot of love is going to ARM64. But the, so the user space packages, such as your DHCP server, or your, uh, your DNS server, or your web server, or all of that sort of stuff, uh, ARM64 is a fully supported platform on FreeBSD. So if it's written in a, an even slightly meaningful programming language, such as, say, C, it is going to, be, it is going to just work out of the box on ARM64. Uh, I, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head of how many of these 20,000 packages just work out of the box, but a substantial subset of them do, like you know, 80 or possibly 90% of them. The things that will not work out of the box on ARM64 are uh, very compute uh, very compute or maths intensive workloads uh, that have been painstakingly and patiently optimized to run on some other architecture. But everything that is general purpose software will just work on ARM64 as well or better as on Intel. The thing to remember is that the ARM64 CPU is a lot slower than your Intel CPU but you just get a lot more of them. You get 96 cores instead of, say, a puny 16 cores. All so, right, any, yeah. any more question? Thank yeah. you, Philip. All right, uh, there's another talk on Wednesday afternoon where you can learn all about FreeBSD. That's Thank you very, very much. interesting, breathless presentation. Thank yes. you for that. I, I blame now, the social event last night from... <laughs> I would like to ask... Uh, Mr. Fuad bin Anayat to come forward and let us know more about the cooling technologies in modern day data center. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, um, Fuad bin Anayat from Fiber at Home talking about cooling technology for network nodes. And we'll take one more second to pop up the presentation. Here it is. OK, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's Fuad bin Anayat, and it is cooling technology for network node. Uh, in today's session, I'll talk about the network node, and then some of the cooling technologies used right now in this area. And uh, in network node, I'll particularly go for the uh, uh, small, medium, and large size data centers, perhaps. Uh, then the industry trained for the power and cooling, uh, then uh, PV calculations, some thumb rules, and transformation towards efficiency. Network nodes. Like I have said, that uh, in the metro scale or in, uh, we'll usually call them POP or ICT room or enterprise data center, sometimes server rooms. Then in regional scale, we are talking we are in a community. Then in global scale, uh, the carrier hotels or the co-location data centers, cloud data centers, something like that. But all are note to me uh, in this presentation. Uh, for the cooling technologies, what Philip have just said, that you use the ARM64 in the Russian Tundra region, or very north of uh, Canada. Don't need anything, free cooling. 
So free cooling technology, natural free cooling, definitely that's the solution. Then uh, free cooling is even upgraded with some Kyoto wheel system or strainer cycle system. But unfortunately, in this part of the world, in apricot region, in Sanog region, they are not applicable. Not for the small, not for the medium, not for the large nodes. Uh, regarding the chemical coolant technology, direct expansion um, coolants, yes, there is Comfort AC. We are right now in the Comfort AC zone. Apart from this, uh, uh, VRF systems are there, where it's Comfort AC as well, but uh, we are su switching on the compressors to minimize the electricity bill. Then precision ACs, especially designed for the uh, what I'll say, the uh, machines, not for the humans. So they are not taking care of the latent heats, but the, they are more taking care of the sensible heats. Uh, then from the AC zone, if we go to the chiller kind of things, then air-cooled chillers are there. You can have a dual circuit system with water as well for the tire three or tire four kind of systems. So air-cooled chiller with or without water. They are applicable in small and medium sized data centers or nodes. Then water coolant technology. In water coolant technology, we are having air cooled water chiller. These are not the direct expansion chillers. But again, uh, for having dual circuit operation, you may have a DX system as a secondary uh, fluid system. Then water cooled water chiller is always there the best uh, efficient um, uh, way of cooling the things. And they are applicable here in this region for the medium and large size nodes. Uh, co uh, coming down to the free cooling technology, very simple. You are having uh, uh, server racks there. And just take away the hot airs from the top of the racks and have a filter so that the contaminations are not coming. And with that filter, just uh, inlet the cold air from the bottom of the racks, and that's it. Uh, bottom and top doesn't mean that you need the uh, raised floor system as well. So pretty simple, ventilation only. But, but as they are not applicable in this region, so I, I'm not elaborating that. So now the downfall, uh, downflow system, that is the chemical coolant system. Here in the top of the top right side, uh, we are seeing that it's a, they are all raised floor system because that is the downflow, but there, there is no containment. Hot air and cold air are mixing. Still, there is a cold plenum. I am pushing the cold air from the uh, bottom of the rack. They are coming in from the top of, uh, in front of the racks, but then the cold air and hot air are mixing. So. Eventually, I am cooling down the hot air exhausted from the racks as well. So I am actually cooling my own, uh, what I'll say, own heat of the servers as well. So then if we come down to the bot bottom right side of the point, there we can see that cold air is contained. So. Uh, again, the cold plenum in the bottom of the uh, race floor, then they are coming out in the, and contained in the cold aisle. And then the racks are uh, taking the cold air and they are exhausting the hot air. The hot air is all over the room. So the entire room, entire node is hot. But still, the minimalistic portion of the uh, node is actually cold where it is needed. It is the most, uh, what I'll say, conventional way of doing things right now, and it is giving you the less electricity bill, but same adequate amount of cooling. But what is the problem? Problem here is that the network guys or the server guys who are working behind the racks, they're actually in the hot zone, so they are sweating. So that's a big problem here. But apart from that, and as it is a, uh, what I have said, the precision cooling system, so Latent heat is not taken care of, so you are actually sweating even more because it is not comfort cooling. Uh, to get rid of that, 
you can may have a bit less uh, efficient system, uh, and that is the chimney system in the top left hand uh, left hand side. That is the entire room is actually the cold plenum, and only the hot is actually retained in the hot aisle. So the hot portion is less, and the cold portion is more. So what is the problem? P problem is that I I am actually cooling down more volume. So that means a bit more electricity bill. And to have a proper return to the uh, air conditioner, I need the chimney system. So the, I also need the uh, cold plenum, sorry, hot plenum, to carry the hot air in the return. Otherwise, the precision AC, AC will lose his life. Uh, it's good for the workers, uh, for us, that we are working in the co cold system, but it is uh, the management is paying a bit more electricity bill. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, we have already understood, but this is the hot aisle containment system with the chimneys, and this is the cold aisle containment system. If you consider that we can uh, give the best to our cli uh, clients or best to our management, hot aisle, uh, cold aisle system with the raised floor is the solution for here. Okay, now again we are continuing with the chemical coolant system, but in row cooling. In in row cooling, uh, there is no loss of air because we are not having any downflow system in the, under the raised floor, we are not actually cooling down the cements and the tiles. So there is no loss of cooling at all. But here the problem is that between, between the racks, there is the uh, in-row coolers. So your refrigeration guys are actually coming just in front of a rack. So if you can tolerate that, it's perfectly okay. And if, eventually it's actually better. But in this part of the world, particularly in Bangladesh, I have found that uh, a refrigeration guy in between the racks making some uh, maintenance work is actually not suiting to our eyes, so we are actually refraining from it. Uh, but in the a bit developed, a bit matured world, it is actually a better solution. Here again, you have two systems. You have the cold dial system in the left side and the hot dial system in the right side, and they work the same way. You can still have in the top of the top uh, uh, picture, we can see that there is the raised floor. That is for the future uh, expansions, that we have all the racks, they are fully loaded, and they are going beyond their capacity, so you need more cooling system. So then, after the in-row cooling, you can actually push the cold air from the bottom. So you can actually implement the in-row and downflow together, but you have to be ready for that. You have to have the race floor system and in-row system, together so that in later stage of your life, uh, data center life, you can actually push the cold air through the plenum. Uh, here again, uh, personally, if you ask that, uh, let's sweat, but give the comfort, comfort to the management. So cold aisle system in, with the in-row cooling will be the best one. Regarding water coolant technology, uh, I'll go with the very simplistic uh, picture in the bottom right-hand corner. Here we can see that just uh, there is the air conditioners, but we are calling them computer room air handlers rather than air conditioners because they are handling the air only. They are not compressors anymore. The compressors' jobs are taken care of by the chillers. So the chiller is actually giving you the cold air and hot air with the pipes. So with the proper insulation in these pipes, you can again have very limited uh, system loss. And air handlers are doing just the same thing. If it is a downflow cooling, they are pushing the air through the raised floor system, down from the raised floor system. If it is a in-row cooling, they are in between the rows. But they are just the air handlers, they don't have the compressors, so actually uh, with the in-row system, you can go with it, because without any compressor, doesn't, uh, that means that there is no water, uh, water system there. So you cannot have eventually any leakage or, or a spray of water between the racks. So 
again, uh, if it is a water-cooled water chiller, then the water needs to be cooled down. So on the other side of the chiller, you need a cooling tower. And if it is an air-cooled water chiller, the chiller itself will cool down by the natural air. Uh, if we compare the air-cooled water chiller and water-cooled water chiller, uh, I'll say that go with, uh, le let's go with the air-cooled water chiller because we are not the industry with the, um, what I'll say, the heavy industries, uh, manufacturing industries. So we cannot maintain the water-cooled water chiller properly. Water-cooled water chiller need a lot of, uh, uh, what I'll say, the water treatments, the filtration, and uh, the pipings should be really taken care. So additional maintenance cost and water treatment cost, these type of things uh, we can avoid because we are not th those kind of heavy industries who are really fond of water-cooled systems. But if, we, if the uh, data center or node is that big that actually demands the water-cooled system, then we have to go for it. Later on, uh, uh, later part of uh, my presentation, I'll go, uh, I'll show you some thumb rules that when we'll pick up air-cooled water chiller, when water-cooled water chiller. Uh, this is a bit different, just to, uh, some statistics. In Bangladesh, uh, if I uh, take some statistics, uh, right now we are using three kilowatt per rack, something like that, maybe 2.5 kilowatt per rack. And uh, I found out some big uh, telcos are using seven kilowatt per rack. That is the Bangladesh story. But uh, regarding, uh, according to IBM, the international data centers nowadays they are using more than 5.5 kilowatt average racks, rack powers, and maybe uh, in 2020 they will go beyond 7 kilowatt. And uh, currently the cloud operators who are very densely populated, like with 52U racks, they are even going to for 30 kilowatts rack. So that's pretty much like heater inside the racks, actually. So whenever we are talking about the power, there is a definitely relationship with the cooling. Why it is required? Because we have a structured cabling. Behind the rack, there's all about a lot of optical fibers and a lot of uh, copper cables. So we have to place them correctly so that air can flow. Whether it is hot, whether it is cold air, they should flow. Just see some pictures, whether they are ideal or not. If you have some <laughs> network nodes like this, there is the small, medium, large, all-scale data centers. Uh, and they are from Bangladesh. Sorry for that. But uh, with how much air, cold air you can push, that doesn't matter because <laughs> they are not getting inside the rack and the cold air, hot air is not coming out of the rack. So structured cabling is very important. Uh, uh, structured cabling is none to do with this kind of things. You have to remember that air should get in and get out of the rack. Uh, some relationship, some basic relationship. Uh, one kilowatt power consumption is one kilowatt heat generation, we all know. Uh, one kilowatt heat generation is requiring one kilowatt cooling capacity to reduce it down. But the problem is that one kilowatt cooling requirement doesn't mean that that will consume one kilowatt of power. Uh, it's just uh, for your food for thought, actually. So now I'm coming, I'm coming down to, sorry, uh, some selection. Uh, these are the, like, with the practice, uh, you'll find out this is the right balance of t technology selection. Like, if my power requirement in a node is uh, from 0 to 20 kilo, uh, 20 ton, ton refrigerant, then uh, VRF or Comfort AC is okay with me. Then you're requiring precision AC when the requirement, cooling requirement is from 20 to 100 ton. Then DX chiller with or without dual fluid circuit is 100 to 200 ton. Then air cooled water chiller with or without dual flu fluid circuit is 200 to 400 ton. And more than 400 ton is water cooled water chiller. But again, uh, 
These all technologies doesn't give, give you like more than 16 kilowatt per rack. So the specific densely populated rack, which is going beyond 30 kilowatt, you need the immersion cooling. That you have to actually place the entire rack under the immersion fluid so that they are cooled down. So it can be glycol, it can be immersion fluid that is kind of oil. So beyond 30 kilowatt till 130 kilowatt per rack, if it is, then with or without this cooling, you have to go for a special kind of submerged cooling technology. Uh, for PUE calculation, uh, it's again thumb rule. Uh, particularly, I have taken completely, what I'll say, unrealistic data that if the ICT power is one kilowatt, that is a completely unrealistic figure. Uh, it's just for the PV calculation that uh, the fans for, uh, free, for free cooling technology, they are consuming around 20% of the power, so 0.2 kilowatt then for your knock and for your office inside, beside the data center or node, they may consume 0.1 kilowatt. So eventually, your total power requirement is 1.3 kilowatt, your UPS out of that is 1.1 kilowatt, and your PUE is 1.3, something like that. And when we are coming, uh, some realistic figures, like precision AC, precision AC will eventually give you 1.8 PUE. Those are based on the data of uh, South Asian region, the Sanog region, particularly. For uh, air-cooled water chiller, if it is a screw type, you'll get 1.6 PV. If it is a magnetic bearing type, then 1.45 PV. So uh, centrifugal chiller will give you 1.7, something like this. So uh, regarding the green grid, the green grid says that if your PV is less than 1.5, less than or equal to 1.5 actually, then you are a green data center. What PUE represents? PUE actually represents the co-location clients that yes, they are having a good PUE, that means they are actually efficient, they are green. So if I've been co-located there, I should have to pay less power for the cooling and I'll get more power for my IT load. So like the IT load is one and you are consuming 1.6, that means that extra 0.6 is for non-required power consumption. So they will have a hint that yes, you are having a good PUV, that means I am getting more power for my IT load. Uh, you have to measure it from PDU level. Uh, inside the rack, PDU level, that should it be. But sometimes people measure the P, uh, PUV from the UPS level. From the UPS level, you'll get very good PV, even 1.1 is possible. But that's not ev eventually realistic. So measurement should be from PDU level. Inefficient data centers is when the PV is more than one, two. So one should not go to a data center who is having more than two PV. Transformation, uh, what should we do? Like for the infrastructure sharing, public will go for public cloud instead of enterprise clouds. So uh, little, little enterprises having their own DC, own DR should move towards public clouds. Public pop instead of enterprise pop, the same it is. So infrastructure sharing, instead of making and uh, operating is your own one. Then node accommodation, that public pop to internet data centers or public cloud to cloud data centers. We have to move towards the common community-based themes. So nodes should be accumulated. And if improvement of PV is required, that UPS and electrical efficiency should be ensured, that which kind of UPS technology, which kind of electrical system is actually more efficient towards PV. And same goes with the cooling efficiency, that which kind of cooling technology, which kind of compressors or motors are actually soothing the PUE. So we should move towards that. And thank you if you have any question. All right, any question? So there was nothing like routing DNS things here, all hard engineering. 
So, anyone with any question? Thank you, Fuad. Thank you. Not for questioning me. <laughs> now, we are going to have some evolution here. Making changes to the data plane encapsulation used within production networks is a challenging proposition. And uh, Richard Bailey from Arista is going to present us the evolution of data plane towards openness and flexibility. And he's ready. Right. G'day. Yeah. Uh, it's almost the end of the day, so I won't take myself too seriously if, if you don't take me seriously as well. Um, let's try to get through it. Uh, we've had some really interesting presentations. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, the, the first two presentations. Uh, I think they're really useful if we look at what's happening in the service space, uh, what's happening in the data center. Uh, the one thing that we haven't talked about so much today uh, is the actual network. Uh, because the network is the thing that connects everything together. So I will try to do that. And with openness and flexibility, uh, it's always a little bit of a treasure hunt. There is always a risk that you get there, but you also get um, booby traps. So let me see if I can help you out. Uh, I've got three parts of the agenda. Uh, that'll help you uh, keep sane. But let's talk about where we are today. And starting within the data center, um, it's kind of uh, been a long evolution from what was uh, just VLANs. And if you look at how networks are built, uh, and at Apricot, I think it's probably fair to say that we do talk about networks. Um, you know, VLANs didn't scale, and so there was a lot of angst around how we were going to scale beyond 4,000 VLANs or past Q&Q. &Q. Um, and it, uh, you know, 2010, 11, uh, VXLAN came along, and it actually, uh, you know, uh, took on and, and killed. Uh, does that look? It's supposed to be green, um, which means it won. But uh, if you look at it, VXLAN was the predominant technology that came out of uh, that battle around 2010, 2011. Now, if you think about why VXLAN uh, was selected. Um, there's a number of different reasons, but if you if you compare it to the other technologies that were uh, uh, that it was up against, uh, what we found though was even though VXLAN was a step forward, it still took many years before the network had caught up to deployment of VXLAN. Now this isn't you know a criticism of VXLAN itself, but the point was that a change in the data plane functionality. Um, was very slow and difficult for everyone to deploy. And I'll talk a little bit about that throughout my presentation. Um, but seven years later, uh, VXLAN is now the de facto for a modern layer th uh, three leaf spine architecture. So it does take time and the benefits are there, but getting there does take a huge amount of time. And so now let's look forward and say, what are the, a lot of the new ideas that people are uh, considering, uh, particularly the IETF uh, NVO3 encapsulation group? Um, there's, there's a lot of discussion around what needs to change uh, within the data center to support uh, a variety of different use cases. Uh, but particularly, we're looking at how we have a, an IP underlay network and how we can stitch services together on top of that. Um, and there's three main uh, you know, schools of thought about a you know, a standard encapsulation, uh, one of which is uh, Geneve, uh, another is uh, GUE, and finally, VXLAN GPE. So all of them have hardware implementation and backward compatibility uh, issues that are worth exploring to really understand what that could actually mean for the network at large. So again, let me put up a chart here, and I'll walk you through just a few of these. So NVO3 was initiated uh, to compare and discuss these current proposals. And uh, Geneve, uh, particularly supported by uh, Deutsche Telekom, has been seen as the, the most suitable starting point, uh, mostly because of its flexibility, this TLV structure. And if you go back through networking protocols, TLVs are always seen as a way of adding future uh, flexibility. Um, but if you look at these sorts of things, uh, one of the points that I would make is um, maximum header length. We see these really huge headers that are creeping into the, uh, the networking space. But because these are also, uh, depending on the protocol identifier as well, you can see that there are different impacts here as well. And so again, if we're changing things in the data plane, 
Remember, it's complex because every single thing in the path needs to understand what it's receiving. And if you receive a packet and it's encapsulated in, in a way that you don't appreciate, what are you going to do? You're going to drop it. Um, and uh, that's, that means that sort of these, uh, these evolutions are if they are to eventuate, are going to require upgrades of all of the networking hardware that exists today. And I can hear everyone go, that's exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to spend my time um, upgrading my existing network. Um, if you look at some of the pain points here, uh, you know, um, the, the first point that I would make is that this, these headers within headers within headers within headers. Um, and if you look at how we uh, process packets when they arrive, uh, you don't want to process one header to realize that there's a second header and a third header. Uh, and it becomes a, uh, you know, a serialization issue for the, the processing of an individual packet itself. Um, and it leads itself towards requiring parallel processing of all the headers. Um, now, if you also look at the uh, competing technologies, uh, you can see here uh, that there's different states of uh, software implementation, uh, there are all obviously different um, IPR and, uh, and backers. But the, the variable header length introduces this new challenge. And as I said, it impacts on uh, the current fixed uh, length pipeline processing. Um, and we see some divergence in requirements as well. Uh, what is required for um, you know, a Facebook um, and a Microsoft may not be required by everyone else. So. Uh, you know, we've got to look at the uh, the suitability in terms of the uh, or the broad broadness of the um, uh, solution and how that applies. Um, and we end up with these extension headers that kind of start to look like babushka dolls. Um, although I believe when I uh, Wikipedia that I'm not actually even using the right name, so I apologise for my upbringing. Um, and then on top of that as well, we start to look about, you know, what about MPLS? And there's been some interesting discussions. I know that uh, Jeff Sch Schmidt from Telstra mentioned uh, SRV6 yesterday and how that was something that Telstra were looking at. Um, and uh, SRV6 is also something that's been mentioned by other uh, global carriers as uh, interesting to uh, their approach to creating, uh, you know, mobile service chaining and network slicing. And if this is the case, well, it's not even being considered uh, by NVO3, although we can actually see that the structure of the, um, uh, the packet actually kind of looks kind of similar. So maybe there's, uh, you know, some high-level belief that they're heading in the same direction. But fundamentally, again, I think that this is ships in the night um, and there's uh, more work to be done. If you look at it today, uh, we're getting really complex when we start adding layers to the network. So we have, uh, in this particular example um, of a really simple uh, DCI um, scenario, um, what you can actually see is we have two VXLAN uh, data centers uh, running uh, EVPN. And then on top of that, we want to connect uh, using uh, EVPN MPLS over an IP network supported by MPLS. Um, and the interactions here uh, start to become quite confusing. Um, and the, the question is, is MPLS as a technology within the DCI or within the wider transport network, is that something that's going to push into the data center? Um, and that's something that you know, I, I know that um, uh, people like Juniper and the Contrail team uh, you know, layer 3 VPN for end systems, that was definitely a, a push to use uh, more broadly MPLS within the, the data center environment. Um, now, if MPLS was unsuccessful so far in becoming the mainstream uh, encapsulation in the data center, um, what is it about these new pro protocols uh, or encapsulation methods, uh, or what challenges um, uh, in the past have they been able to solve. Or the other alternative is even stranger, which is that the data center protocols, things like uh, VXLAN, might actually push out further outside the data center and VXLAN could become a, uh, a more broad, uh, broadly adopted um, transport encapsulation. And we might see that more in the, uh, in the metros, the DCIs, and then expanding across the network. So this is, uh, I think, a, a fundamental question that Everyone who operates either a data center or a wide area network actually needs to spend some time looking into is if we're going to start creating uh, you know, a, an encapsulation method uh, within the data center, uh, which we believe you know, takes us forward into future protocols, maybe we should be looking at the impacts both within and without so that we can look at simplification. Because at this, the rate we're going, we're creating layer upon layer, uh, and therefore uh, we're creating more complexity that we have to manage. Okay, so moving forward, we have all this complexity. How do we actually support that within the network? Uh, well, the, the, 
the uh, simplest option would be uh, to, to take your Yeah, I'm, I'm looking in the back of the room to see if anyone pulled the plug, but I think that was just uh, bad timing. Um, but yeah, we could just take the network and we could buy a new one, but that's not cost effective for anyone. So the question is, what can we do as we know that these changes are coming, but there's still some disagreement about what the future looks like, what are we actually going to do today that can help future-proof some of what we do? Um, and this is also something that, you know, working for a uh, networking vendor who builds network equipment, it's also something that we consider ourselves around how are we designing network equipment that has a lifespan beyond the next couple of years, which I'm sure you're glad to hear. Um, and network encapsulations, um, these are really tricky and that's, they're really slow to move for a number of different reasons. Um, because firstly, all these ideas are not assured, like we're not confident that uh, if you go back and look at the, uh, the chart that I presented at the very beginning, there was a number of different encapsulations that people were talking about and really excited about. And, you know, they, they might be great technology, uh, but if they don't get implemented, then uh, people, you know, people don't need them. So there's, uh, success is not assured from the development of the technology or the protocols themselves. Um, and therefore, there's some reluctance to necessarily deploy them. Uh, and if you look at encapsulations and how, or data plan encapsulations, uh, that's required either, you know, uh, a greenfield deployment, which no one really has, uh, tunneling, which is something that we love, adding more state to the network, or a forklift, which is the worst case. So there is an emerging trend within network silicon to be more programmable. Um, and programmability, like automation or SDN, uh, these terms are, are widely overused, so I'll uh, attempt to explain this in a little bit more detail as well. Um, Especially as we see, uh, if you look at merchant silicon, uh, I think that this is something a few years ago people would say, yeah, look, uh, to be honest, you know, we're going to bake the encapsulations into the chip. The chip will do one function. Uh, it's not realistic to expect uh, us to be able to program the pipelines after the chip has been built. And, and really, the only network processors that have done that have been the, the custom in-house silicon uh, that's typically been uh, you know, put, put out by the, uh, the largest network vendors, uh, which tend to be typically more expensive than the merchant silicon as well, which has created that dichotomy between the, the white box movement, which is uh, typically cheaper merchant silicon, versus the, uh, the power of the, um, uh, the expensive in-house silicon as well. But here's the thing that really uh, kills it for me, um, and I've included a reference that you can go read uh, one of the great contributions by uh, Bruno Richman and uh, Jerome Mossand, uh, you know, uh, who wrote some very thoughtful points. But when you, when you change data plan encapsulations, it's not just about the network path itself, but there's so many different things that look at network traffic as it flows across your, uh, your business, and they include things like uh, GSLBs, firewalls, DPIs, um, IDSs, NAT gateways, content caches, uh, network packet brokers, uh, DDoS protection, etc. And these things all are impacted by some form of new encapsulation. Some of the dependencies are hardware based, and as I said, in a good situation, maybe you drop the packet. In a bad situation, maybe you crash that particular device. Um, and so therefore, it's really important that we understand the, the risks associated here. In terms of the programmability, one example um, here uh, is the uh, uh, Cavium uh, XP80. Um, and if you look at what happened, um, let me start on the, the right-hand side. Um, if you look at the top, when uh, VXLAN, the RFC came out in 2011, it still took at least a two-year gap before we started to see the, uh, the Trident 2 or the Tomahawk chips arrive with support for VXLAN. And even with the early uh, Trident 2, there were limitations around things like uh, routing in and out of tunnels or riot, so VXLAN routing. And what that meant was uh, there was advantages to adopting the chips and technologies that could support basic functionality, um, but then you also knew that in the next year or two there was going to be uh, better performance and scale, but also uh, new capabilities that would also change the architecture and avoid punting traffic from a switching layer to a routing layer and back and forth. And so that meant that there was really, from the RFC being released up until you know, 2014, 2015, before the, the true power of the uh, protocols could start to be uh, taken advantage of. 
if you look at, say, now something like the XP80, uh, if a new protocol or encapsulation method uh, was, uh, was defined, um, it's possible to create um, a, a, uh, a software update that enables that chip to be reprogrammed. Uh, that means that you could support those, uh, those changes uh, in a much shorter time frame. So that would suggest, at least from a, a, a cursory point of view, that programmable silicon um, has at least that advantage when you know that there's uh, change coming in the future, and it's an area that should be um, at least studied and understood. On the left-hand side, you know, the, the point isn't to teach you about the XP80 architecture. Who wants to know more about the XP80 architecture? Uh, Kareti, okay, we'll go for Kareti. Um, so as you would probably already know Kareti, um, it's a uh, upgradable chipset. Um, it's parallel processing, so all those different layers, you can parallel, uh, parallelize them so that you can uh, get more efficiency as the packets come through the network. Uh, and finally, it has, as uh, will become a common theme, uh, it has a programmable API that enables uh, the, uh, the chip to be driven uh, using a, a software development methodology. If you look uh, at 2018, uh, it's programmable silicon is going to go from being a, uh, I would say, uh, a niche capability of something like a Uh, a niche capability of um, a Cavium chip to a more broad stream uh, Broadcom uh, XGS fa uh, family with the Flex G uh, X, uh, sorry, uh, Flex GS uh, programmable pipeline. Um, and this information is public domain, so uh, I'm not sharing anything uh, from their confidential roadmap. But what you can see here is not only do they support some of the protocol encapsulations that I mentioned, such as um, the uh, VXLAN GPE in Geneva, uh, but having uh, the programmability of the, uh, the chip itself, um, opening up the, uh, the SDK capabilities um, and providing a, so here with the, the open NSL library, but also supporting uh, a range of different protocols. It's everything that you love about the previous Trident, but everything that they also think might be coming in the future. And there's an opportunity as well for uh, the network vendors uh, to be selective about what uh, profiles you apply onto the chip. So it, that does mean that there is going to be some lessening of those impacts or the risks that I mentioned um, at the start. But there, you know, it will take time for uh, Trident 3 to start to filter into uh, daily purchasing decisions. Who's interested in buying a new network just for programmability? That is exactly what I thought. Then it gets even uh, deeper, and I think that this slide is going to be too small uh, to see on the screen that we have, but if you look at uh, the next evolution, rather than supporting, and I mentioned the different SDKs uh, that Cavium and Broadcom support, instead of having to write something to the SDK of a particular chip vendor. Uh, the approach with P4 is to have a target independent uh, method for delivering um, a reference architecture for a uh, uh, network silicon uh, or a, a, um, a pipeline for your uh, packet processing. Now, what this means is that you could have um, a uh, community of developers writing uh, network uh, silicon pipelines that can then be shared across different silicon environments. So that's where it becomes target independent. And so one example, and these are diagrams from uh, Barefoot, um, is the um, uh, six and a half terabit per second uh, Barefoot Tofino chip. Um, again, it's a protocol independent switch architecture, meaning that it's a pretty basic chip when you get it. It doesn't, if you were to boot it up, it doesn't have a lot of uh, already defined structure. The structure itself is entirely programmable, much like a, an x86. When you boot up an x86, it doesn't do anything um, until you load an operating system, until you start to uh, give it instructions. And it's entirely field reconfigurable. Um, obviously, there's the... Um, uh, Capilano SDE, but with P4, um, what you can start to do is you can start to use that um, 
uh, pipeline model more abstractly across a, a range of different technologies. But what you can also do is you can pick and choose the applications that you might want to embed within network silicon. And this is particularly exciting for a lot of people because, for instance, if you look at the list that's uh, listed here, you could turn on different capabilities based on what you're actually planning to do. So things like layer 4 load balancing, network address translation, um, advanced telemetry. If you needed those features, you can tick them as part of your uh, standard P4 deployment model, and when you deploy them onto your, uh, your network device, suddenly you have a device that's acting like a layer 4 load balancer or a NAT gateway. And if you don't need those functionalities, then you can turn them off, and when you uh, program your device, suddenly it's acting much more like a lean uh, you know, workhorse that's just going to forward uh, packets at low latency as, as fast as it can. So there is, there is some trade-off, but the scale of barefoot is the thing that's most interesting with 6.5 terabits per second, meaning that it's now beyond a low-scale system and into a system that could generally be used in a, in a number of different scenarios. And so it becomes quite an interesting model for deployment. Um, if you look at the implication here, uh, then, it, you know, and I'll give you an example. Obviously, so for Arista, where I work, uh, we have a development model, and we use that to deploy our networking operating system across a range of different network silicons. Now, what that means is that the work that we do only translates to the hardware that we make. And that's interesting if you want to buy our products, but it's not interesting if you don't want to buy our products. So using P4 as a community means that the work that we do actually goes into a, a broader set of developers to work on features that are you know, commonly required across a range of different vendors or a range of different uh, silicon op um, uh, vendors. And that means that the um, there's no duplication of effort to build the same features again and again and again just for the different underlying silicon platforms. And so what you can see on the right-hand side is with P4 abstracting between the network operating system and the underlying silicon, that you can actually have uh, a uh, an, uh, deployment which has uh, broader feature development and also a faster time to market. Now, what that means is um, you end up with better features sooner and with higher confidence because they've been deployed um, in a number of scenarios already and it hasn't been rewritten. Now, obviously, Arista is only one example, but we believe that this model works because it's what we use internally to support a range of different silicon families with one single uh, operating system binary. So we know the approach does work. Uh, but what's um, interesting is that um, Juniper recently announced, uh, and I've included a link to their blog post on this as well, uh, that they're supporting P4, um, the runtime support, across their platforms as well. Now, uh, much like open uh, config is, as well, just because you implement uh, an API doesn't mean that everything that can be done through that API is supported on the underlying hardware platform. So let me be very clear. When I started, I, I talked about the challenges of a new data plan encapsulation and how you could support that um, with programmable silicon. Implementing the P4 API, runtime API, doesn't necessarily mean that the network silicon is programmable to allow a future um, encapsulation method. But what it does mean, at least from an abstraction point of view, that software applications that are written on top of that, um, that P4 uh, runtime can be used consistently to control different vendors' equipment. So that's a, a brief um, variation on, on P4 and how it can be used as an abstraction for control as well. So if you put it all together, I think the point that I, I started to make uh, with VXLAN and, um, and MPLS, if you take it more generally, what we see is outside the data center, we see convergence between what's happening um, in the transport network and the cloud domain. It used to be that you would draw a network and the network would be the, uh, the, the gateway to the cloud. But if we look at what's happening, particularly with uh, carrier networks, is that cloud has moved from being something publicly reachable on the internet to the model for the data center and for SPNFV or telco cloud and now for um, MEC, multi-edge compute, formerly known as uh, mobile edge compute. So we see compute moving all the way across uh, the network as we optimize for performance. 
So cloud is really great, but the further you are away from it, the, um, uh, the, the worse experience that you have. And so for uh, some applications, so I'll give you one example, for things like cloud DVR, where an end user wants to do, you know, uh, to watch content from the, uh, the network, um, having that a long way away is a user experience issue uh, when they try to change content. <coughs> Pardon me. So cloud will continue to, to, in its drive closer and closer to the end users. Um, that, is, um, that is unstoppable. But what that means is also these uh, new protocols that we're discussing for the, net, uh, sorry, for the data center, they're also pushing further and further into the network as well and will sit above the, uh, the transport protocols. And so really there will be a reckoning between what is the predominant model for a transport network architecture, which today um, is very much with uh, MPLS, um, and in the future, you know, maybe MPLS or a variation with segment routing, um, and then what is in the, the data center um, at the moment, uh, VXLAN heading towards EVPN and potentially EVPN uh, MPLS as well. Uh, if you look at the, the benefits of convergence, uh, reducing the total, uh, the number of devices within the network, I think that's a, an admirable goal and definitely achievable. Uh, reducing the layers of protocols and the need for extension headers, uh, this is an absolute for me. Um, we are getting to the point where there's layers upon layers upon layers upon layers of abstraction. Um, and if you're interested in the security, uh, securing SDN, uh, session tomorrow afternoon, uh, that'll be part of the discussion, is um, if we start to build for uh, services for a cloud environment, we start to even forget the underlay and the underlay of the underlay, um, and they become you know, abstracted and hidden away, but someone still has to build and operate that platform. Um, in terms of simplified operation models, uh, you know, a network with fewer devices, either horizontally or vertically, is easier to operate. Um, and it also enables us to change the type of silicon that we might deploy. And so I think this is, for me, a very interesting discussion around how we can simplify the need within the transport layer as we become more dependent on the, uh, the cloud layer for, um, uh, for services and for state and moving state out of the network, enabling us to use a, a closer to a P4 or a white box, ar box architecture. And that actually assists us with blurring the line between uh, physical and uh, virtual resources, which is a critical issue. This slide could be a presentation on its own. So let me wrap it all up, and I'm, I'm sure there'll probably be a, a few questions. There's a lot of ground that you know, we've covered in uh, 27 minutes. Um, if you look at future extensibility, uh, like headed chaining, um, it starts with the, the infrastructure. And so all these ideas that we've talked about in terms of you know, uh, SRV6, as I mentioned, or um, network slicing, these are, you know, we talk about them as abstract concepts. We're gonna logically have multiple users of the network. But it has to land somewhere, and it's going to land um, in the, the silicon itself. We've had different architectures in the past, like OpenFlow um, and uh, you know, different flow models, where we were looking to bridge the gap between the need of an application and the programmability in the data plane. And it's a very difficult um, uh, problem, specifically if you need to upgrade the, the chips and older equipment no longer becomes deployable. Uh, P4, I think it's very interesting for a couple of different reasons. One is the programmability, which gives us the opportunity to support new encapsulations. The other is, is an abstraction model or uh, creating target independent reference architectures that we can use to deploy network features into silicon from different vendors, uh, meaning that we can get more economies of scale, faster time to market, and broader features deployed uh, sooner. Uh, and that's particularly true, particularly as the carrier core and edge routers start to become more open to disruption from merchant silicon. Uh, and finally, openness and flexibility, they're essential design goals. However, without careful consideration, this notion of flexibility that we're going to create different service paths and therefore we need to create greater complexity uh, within the, uh, the network itself, um, that limits the full range of technologies that we can deploy. So we have to be very clear about how we search for openness and what exactly openness means to us. If openness is about being able to uh, create a, uh, a completely flexible model, then that flexibility comes at a cost. Um, and so we have to understand the trade-offs between um, openness and flexibility, but we also need to understand the risks from complexity and the benefits of simplicity.
Okay, so that's 28 minutes. That's my time. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to take them. Xiao Wen, um, do you need, you probably need a yes, microphone. Yes. Uh, this is Shalom from uh, Juniper Networks. So after your session, I saw you introduced uh, several chip here. So eventually, uh, Kevin, uh, like a barefoot and uh, free. So the, to, to us, after reading all those messages, it means um, if you try to see all the problem gone, right? Why bother to build a Kevin on barefoot? Try to fix all the problem, right? Uh, Even the the new protocol introduced, uh, like um, some something, and also the all the uh, telemetry information and so on. So a lot of uh, people, uh, customer, why talking to OTT in China, Japan, somehow, they they think seems like uh, they had played Trident three. So no other chips. Don't talk to me any other chip. So what what do you think about uh, all the you building, yeah. Sure. Uh, so I think my, my paraphrase of the question is, um, won't Trident 3 win and therefore everyone else should um, lay down their arms? Uh, I think that, that the, the, um, in technology there's always uh, competition and competition is healthy. Um, and so having, you know, Cavium and Barefoot challenging uh, Broadcom might be the reason that Broadcom has moved to more programmability. That could be one uh, one method. I think competition, particularly in in silicon, um, is a, a really good thing. And if you look at what's been happening in silicon uh, over the last few years, uh, the pace of innovation in silicon um, is amazing right now. And it doesn't really seem that, but it's um, we're seeing some changes in step functions. Uh, that will halve the cost of bandwidth over the next year and a half. Um, and that's, uh, I know that's a, a, a really massive claim, uh, but as we move from 25 gig thirties to 50 gig thirties and 100 gig thirties by 2020, um, the amount of raw throughput we can put through a single chip is astounding. Uh, I don't know if anyone saw the telegeography presentation around uh, subsea cable systems. Um, if you look at the capacity of these systems, we're talking in the order of tens of terabits per second. And the chips that are coming into market now are, you know, exceeding. So um, uh, Tomahawk 2 announced December last year uh, has a capacity of 12.8 terabits per second, one single chip. So what we're seeing is the, um, the absolute result of competition. Now, will everything be uh, Trident 3? Perhaps. Um, but... Yeah. Exactly. So that was, in fact, you, you made my point, so I'll, I'll say it again. Um, Trident 3 has obviously a sweet spot, but then there's other sweet spots, and so maybe Tomahawk or uh, Jericho um, from, from Broadcom. Um, but there's also functionality if you look at things like, um, uh, you know, network address translation or stateful functions. Uh, these aren't what the XGS has been designed for, and that leaves opportunities for, for barefoot. Um, at the end of the day, what we're going to end up with is more powerful, more flexible, uh, and cheaper network equipment. So I think that outcome is, is definitely worthwhile, and I don't think it's going to be dominated by just one uh, silicon vendor. Any other questions? Cool. I guess that's what we are uh, in the timeline. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our session. Thank you for your attention.